I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of JBL uh, to another one of our JBL Harmon Pro webinars. Today we have, I will go with a very distinguished guest. Sam Burkow has had a relationship with JBL way back when, uh, when I started 23 years ago. And JBL Smart was a software product that was being marketed by JBL. And somebody ushered me into a conference room and said, hey, this is Sam Burko. You've got to meet Sam. He has the software program that we sell. And that was the first time I met Sam and I got to know Smart. And Sam is very well known as the creator of Smart, which is pretty much a mainstay in anybody's audio toolbox, I think, and has been for years. But since progressed on the SIA Acoustics doing room design for some fantastic facilities around the US, around the globe, really. So we're very excited to have Sam Burko with us. Sam, say hello to Hi, your cheering crowd. Yeah, thank you all for taking some time. And thanks to the folks at JBL and Harmon for inviting me to give a little talk. Um, I think you guys have a Q&A box so that uh, if there's questions, I can address them. Uh, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end as well. Um, <clears throat> so feel free to type away. And for those of you who know me, the harder the questions, the uh, more fun we'll have. Um, <clears throat> so. The topic is acoustical challenges when designing um, performance worship and production spaces. And that's kind of a misnomer because as anyone who works in this industry knows these days, um, every production and worship space is, or I'm sorry, every performance and production space, let me try this again. Every perf uh, performance and worship space is a production space. Um, my firm, SIA Acoustics, we've been around since the mid 80s or late 80s. And I started at Artec uh, working for Russ Johnson. And these are some of our projects from the last few years. Um, we are one of the few firms that designs um, a wide range and has always felt that the acoustics of recording studios and um, concert halls and uh, production spaces are all intertwined as the same with worship spaces. Um, they have different requirements, but it's the same group of solutions that we apply to these spaces. Um, from a room acoustics point of view, um, we have a, whoop, we have uh, the same challenges space planning, how the room is gonna sound, acoustic isolation, noise abatement, that tends to be property line issues, ambient noise, site conditions, I'll talk about that, construction challenges, uh, things like out of sequence construction, which acoustical details often require, permitting and code issues, operational complexity. I didn't put down budget, but that's always a challenge uh, at any level. Um, and programming pri uh, priorities. The client really wants it all. You know, um, one of the things we spend a lot of time doing is explaining that operational flexibility means a huge increase in operational cost. So the more different types of uh, productions, performances, worships, uh, services that you want to uh, uh, satisfy the needs for, both technical and acoustical, uh, the more it costs to build the place and operate it. So I thought I would give you a few examples of some fun challenges and look at some fun pictures of some projects. Um, this is a picture I know Brent is on. I don't know if Zoe's around, um, but this is a really fun project for me. Uh, it's at the Palms Hotel in Las Vegas, which is um, currently closed. Uh, but when it reopens, uh, this is a part of it. Uh, this is a 2,600 seat rock and roll theater. And we spent a tremendous amount of time trying to uh, make it the best sounding venue we could uh, at the time. It opened with the first uh, self-powered JBL Vertec rig, believe it or not. 
Um, you can see from this picture that we have uh, what we call royal boxes. Uh, and as you can imagine, in a casino, that's the big gamblers get those seats. Um, but it was that design allowed us to keep almost everyone out from under a balcony. Um, if you look where the screen is, and they've been replaced since, um, you can see a slotted wall. That, that slotted wall is actually made of uh, laminated MDF, um, medium density fiberboard. And the guy who did that bought a routing machine specifically for this project. Um, trucks would pull up with MDF on one side of his building. They'd go through the routing machines and the trucks would be on the other side to drive them away. One of the big challenges of this design was that the room was below ground. So we had to deal with the site conditions. In this case, there's actually, believe it or not, water underground and um, the types of soil and the uh, stability of that soil in Las Vegas is not always easy. Another uh, interesting point was you can see this rear wall. Um, this rear wall has a interesting road behind it. It's the fire access lane. So we had surveyors come out and then the fire marshal come out and measure. And they said they would be happy to give us up to a quarter inch tolerance uh, to make it sure it was wide enough for uh, fire lane access. Um, the other thing is that all this area you see uh, was below ground. So we had to dig it out uh, next to a casino. And you can see the framing for the royal boxes here and the rake seating. One of the things was that in a rock and roll room, we had to have the floor um, uh, flat because we wanted to have general admission. And then we had to find storage, which meant excavating further back so that we could have uh, storage space under the rake seating. This shows you the uh, way that all the materials came into the facility. Um, uh, you don't necessarily think about this when you're laying out a design, uh, but we really couldn't go back any further. That is, as I said, a fire lane. So we used it as our access and built a ramp, um, which made things interesting as you went on. Um, here's another picture of the area and you can see where these gentlemen are standing is part of the area that was excavated out so that eventually you could go out the vomitory, come around and access storage for chair storage. This is a cute little um, detail, but it's an example of out of sequence construction. You'll notice that it's double wall design to keep sound from the lobby. And there's a slot here. And that slot has an automated uh, curtain that can be pulled down. These holes uh, offer uh, some acoustical advantages in that the curtain is heavyweight. Uh, it's a 22 ounce uh, synthetic velour. And that curtain is automated. The automation system is accessible and the curtain is accessible by an access panel above. But these walls had to be built they put the electric in prior to building, but they wouldn't install the curtains. So they actually had to reopen the wall and put the curtains in and then uh, close it back up again. So you have out of sequence construction, which in, uh, in the construction world is the equivalent of ka for the contractor. Hey, Sam, quick question. They didn't use a variable acoustic system uh, that was curtain based in the rest of the facility though, did they? No, they, we didn't. Um, we decided that there wasn't enough variation in the uh, room to need it. We built an incredibly large base trap up at the very rear top uh, behind where it says slatted wood finish. But um, the idea of these curtains was that one of my pet peeves is when you're under a balcony, uh, you get base buildup. So you have to do a lot of low frequency absorption. Well, if you've dealt with design issues, knowing that raising the ceiling above you changes sight lines, it makes it uh, hard. And often balcony thicknesses are dictated by the thickness of the structure, right? Uh, you can't make them any thinner without paying 
a huge price. So you're sort of, your hands are sort of tied. Low frequencies um, like diaphragmatic curtains that they're hanging give you some real absorption. And one of the really nice things is if you start walking at the cross aisle and you walk up uh, with your eyes closed, um, you don't really realize that you're under the balcony acoustically until you get to the last row. So that's a really nice way to be listening. Um, have as many people get as similar a sound as possible. Um, these uh, curved and perforated metal um, panels are curved in plan and they're perforated and they're scalloped in section. And my idea was that it should look like the score of um, a music staff. And the lights were intended to look like notes. I originally uh, laid out the lights um, to play Beethoven's Fifth, but the, uh, the, the Ode to Joy theme, but uh, the architects decided and lane designers that they would do their job and I shouldn't be uh, intruding on their uh, space. Um, this is a picture of what the system looks, the, the room. Um, the rig is really big. Um, the, original, uh, the original Vertec rig uh, has been replaced, but it served the room well for, I think, 10 years. Um, what was really interesting about it is that we put as many boxes on it as the flying frame would hold. And the reason was that we never wanted anyone to take it down. So no one could come in and say, you don't have enough uh, PA. The other reason was as the arrays get longer, you get more and more dispersion control. Um, you get more and more dispersion control at low frequencies. And this venue is um, connected to a high-end recording studio that is up in the tower on the third floor. Um, so it has direct analog and digital split system on the mics and all the lines so that they can record multi-track in the studios. Here's another picture of it. Um, I, uh, your power trio rocking out here. Um, it's a really wonderful place to go listen to a concert. I'm a big fan of this space. Um, one of the fun things about my um, career is that I'm a really terrible musician, but I get a chance to uh, play on stages. So uh, when we installed the new system, I got to uh, pick up a couple guitars and um, play a bit and other people would play and we'd all take turns listening. It was just fun. Um, Here's an interesting project that had a different set of uh, challenges. And hold on, we have a Q&A. No, there's no, no glass behind there. Uh, the question was, were there just curtains in the openings or was there glass behind? And uh, the answer was, um, uh, the answer was uh, no glass. Uh, we didn't care if the sound got in there. We put loudspeakers in the lobby behind and you're about two stories below the uh, casino. Uh, so that was, uh, so no, there was no glass. It was just the curtain. This is um, a beautiful view from uh, Howard Hughes Corporation's offices. Uh, that's in lower Manhattan and you're looking directly eastward and you'll see a building at the bottom. And that building is Pier 17. Some people know it as the South Street Seaport. And I got a call about a project. And the question was, um, you know, uh, can we put a concert venue on a rooftop? And it wasn't this rooftop, but we ended up rebuilding this building with the idea of putting 4,000 people right there. And that would be the stage location and we would fire southward. And that's the stage. Um, it's a removable stage. It comes down in the winter time. They do an ice skating rink up there. Uh, this year they kept the stage up all year because 
of COVID, but the sound system and all the equipment and the, um, uh, the, the trusses and rigging all went away. Uh, it's one of the most amazing backdrops to sit and watch a show uh, with the Brooklyn Bridge right behind you. You're looking north here. Uh, here you can see Pier 17 on the East River, Wall Street, Lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan has become filled with very expensive condos. And for those of you who know Brooklyn, Dumbo is right here. Um, and uh, Brooklyn Heights is right here. And if you're not really, really rich, you don't live in either one of those two places. Um, those people do not want to hear music. So we had to come up with solutions. And what we did was we drew a circle. We looked at our dispersion patterns uh, and we put 30 people with sound level meters all within this circle and literally set up a test rig. Uh, this was the test rig and uh, played music as loud as we could get the test rig to go and played music for several hours to see if we could uh, I was gonna say piss off neighbors, but I don't think you can say that in a Harmon uh, video. So if we keep, would have disturb anyone and we were able to do it using an adaptive uh, system that does adaptive dispersion uh, at both the main clusters and there are 24 subs there. And as usual, we take a few minutes. Uh, that's my friend, Jeff. And we uh, decided to play some music uh, out and you can see the people on the bridge going, I wonder what's going on. There's two guys with no audience. That shows you the view uh, when you're on a house right, looking back towards Manhattan and it's really quite nice. From the South Street uh, called the Seaport District, uh, that's the stage and you can see how close we are to residences and people who don't want to be disturbed. Um, we had a very creative lighting design uh, that allows us to do a lot of lighting tricks, high-end video, and uh, um, we had 11 noise complaints uh, in our first year of operation and 11 noise complaints in the second, and three of those complaints each year were on nights where someone else was doing something and we were dark. So that's much better than the hundreds of noise complaints they used to have at the South Street Seaport. So, hey, Sam, I, I note that you're using a pretty tall array again to exploit the vertical directivity. Um, that certainly always helps to try to keep neighbors happy. Uh, we ran into similar things at the Greek Theater in LA years ago. Yes. Uh, they used to have all kinds of complaints from the expenses houses up kind of rigging that canyon above the Greek Theater. Uh, mm -hmm. when they finally did put in a taller array, which uh, Brad Ricks, who I think is on this call, uh, was one of the people working on that. You sure find out who is a music lover and who isn't, but uh, most people aren't when they're trying to have a kid's birthday party and they have, you know, Iron Maiden playing instead of Barney the Dinosaur. So mm -hmm. you guys ran into, obviously, a lot of SPL and property line issues, which a lot of us see on anywhere from, you know, municipal concert series and parks to any kind of an outdoor thing. Um, what are what are some of the best ways that you found uh, uh, to keep a thumb on SPL, a property line? Um, first of all, uh, it's a great question. The interesting thing is that um, low frequency sounds, that 80 to 120 hertz range, is responsible for about 75% of noise complaints. And we can talk about the psychoacoustics of it, but what it is is that thumping bass that people hate. Uh, it's hard for them to localize. Your brain goes, that doesn't seem right. Um, and people feel very disturbed by it. So I'm a huge fan of cardioid subwoofer arrays. Um, I'm also a big fan of, if you have long arrays, uh, running them as low as you can and making that conversion from the uh, long array into a cardioid sub pattern or an adaptive sub pattern at a frequency that's determined by the relative level of the two, the, the subwoofer system and the low frequency device. Um, 
we work with a lot of municipalities uh, working on noise code and uh, deciding that. Um, here are two venues that have a problem that, uh, a challenge really that um, uh, was new for me. And that is, this is uh, Brooklyn Bowl Las Vegas. It's a 1500 seat venue. Uh, they do a lot of sort of New Orleans jam band, funk uh, bands, and they have 32 bowling lanes, uh, both on the lower level here and upstairs. And how can you have a concert directly next to a bowling lane? And the answer is that this part of the building, we floated the bowling slabs um, and they use a quieter pin setter and a bunch of acoustical treatment. And believe it or not, the ax cannot hear the bowl. Uh, even acoustic acts. Uh, it works out really well. Again, long arrays. Um, in this case, because we have a balcony, um, I try not to fly subs as much as possible unless they're in long arrays, but we do have some cardioid subs flying up top uh, just to um, give a little pump to the people sitting upstairs. Here you can see a little bit of the bowling alleys behind. Um, I'm on the stage right side looking slightly back. Um, you can't see it, but there's actually you can see here, there's lots of diffusion up above here and um, the balcony fronts have uh, are covered with diffusive surfaces and there's low frequency absorbers uh, up and behind this area and at the back of the room. This is what the room looks like when it's empty and you can actually see some of the acoustical um, this is a Flutter X panel uh, sitting there and they stagger in plan. So it's about four inches thick. Here you can see the cardioid subwoofers. This is Nashville. This is tragic. I, I wanna cry when I show you this. Um, what's interesting about it is that those rectangles on the back are uh, a, a custom version of a standard product. The standard product is a four foot by four foot tuned low frequency absorber. And what I was saying earlier about every venue, and this, this is particularly true for worship spaces, uh, is that people are broadcasting from these areas. Um, and so the acoustics of the rooms change. In this case, uh, the room dimensions and the space that was available led us to believe we were gonna have low frequency um, wash on the stage, even with our long arrays and our cardioid subs uh, because of the dimensions. And so we came up with this array of low frequency absorbers and they made them eight feet tall and four feet wide. So it gives you a sense of scale there. Um, unfortunately, this venue hasn't opened yet. Um, they, uh, I tuned it uh, March 6th or 7th. We were about to do an opening, the tornado had just hit and then COVID. So we never had a crowd in there. They have done some um, really wonderful uh, webcasts. Uh, the Brooklyn Bowl people are really great. They're just uh, wonderful people, uh, real music lovers. Here's what it looks like under construction. Again, more bowling lanes here, um, fancy seating, leather backs, and you can see uh, open balcony rails so that we have uh, acoustical transparency. Um, big arrays, subs on top, and a bunch of subs under the stage uh, in a cardioid configuration. Um, here's a venue. I know I saw Dave Glasser's name on the attendee list, and uh, Dave uh, is a great mastering engineer and a good friend from Boulder, someone I uh, really respect and admire. And um, Having worked with him and in Boulder a bunch, uh, I was asked to work on E-Town Hall. And E-Town Hall is an old church. For those of you who don't know E-Town, it's a great radio show. Go to etown.org, it's free. Um, it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, their um, motto is music, community, ideas. Um, they, do, they bring in alternative artists, they uh, talk to them about what social issues, they're big environmentalists, uh, lots of fun people, um, lots of great music, 220 seats. Um, there's a great video online on etown.org 
uh, time lapse of the construction of this building. We had to gut it, but we kept the original stone. Uh, the ceiling was plastered. We took the plaster down. I saw the ribs. I was like, let's keep it and make it feel more intimate. And we'll, uh, we'll treat the uh, ceiling uh, with some diffusion and a uh, bunch of absorption. It's sprayed uh, with K13. We can see that because we had parallel walls, um, there's some diffusion on the side walls to address any potential flutter echo. Um, tiny little line arrays. Um, we didn't get the low frequency control, but it's mostly acoustic music. There are subs under the stage. And when they need subs, they bring in additional subwoofers. Um, the back wall, we, this floor that you're seeing here had to come down so uh, because it was structural and sound. So we took the wood from the first floor and I turned it into a custom diffuser that I designed and we restored the uh, decorative window. The mixed position has uh, low frequency and mid frequency absorption panels and a set of diffusers behind it uh, that scatter mid high frequencies and have low frequency absorption behind. Please give more details about limiting the sound using the splay angle only. Um, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a good question. Uh, this is going back to what I was talking about. Um, the adaptive systems let you use, um, uh, let you use uh, DSP processing to control the uh, horizontal and the vertical dispersion. So uh, the cabinets, you pay a big price for that. But in this case, we did use the EAW uh, cabinet, um, but there are a bunch of different ones. And I think that that's going to be a big part of the future of audio, I really do. Um, I, I think adaptive systems are pretty great. Um, I'd like to do more. Um, here is a layout of the um, uh, of the um, E Town Hall studio complex. I'm going to go back one second and point out that this wall is in fact the upstage wall, and these stairs lead to the stage. So um, if you're standing here, uh, if you're in the studio, the wall you're looking at is a wall I put in front of a cinder block wall, which we went back and grout filled. Um, there's a couple of edit suites, uh, video, and one with a little voiceover booth uh, that we put in a green room. But this wall was the challenge. So you'll also notice, I guess, that this studio has an asymmetric rear wall. Uh, the corners are cut at a different angle. I think I'm the only person who does a lot of that these days. Um, the first one we did was David Glasser's room in Boulder, the first room. And uh, I called him up. I said, I have a crazy idea. And he said, if it doesn't work, how hard is it going to be to fix? And I'm going, yeah, let's make it work. So uh, I've been doing a lot of them since then. I really like the asymmetric rear walls. Um, again, uh, low noise, low velocity air conditioning, uh, windows. Here you go, guys. Windows should tilt. Top, out, bottom, in. Reflection should go up to the ceiling. The reason that they went the other way in the old studios was because they couldn't control lights like we can, and they were worried about glare. But we have all sorts of ways to control light and anti-glare surfaces. And if you think about it, why would you want a reflection going down behind the console and under the console when you could have it go up into the ceiling? These are acoustical soffits. There's no chipboard in them. Um, uh, uh, what else can I say? Um, uh, these are some good monitors that I like. Uh, the room is quite a nice size. And of course, it's tied to the stage and all of the other technical rooms. This is the studio. These walls are separate and isolated from the structural wall. Um, this is an acoustical soffit that has a pop-up. Uh, the framing for that pop-up is um, really interesting. So what I thought I would talk about here, let me see what's on the question thing here. I see there are a bunch. Um, can we get along with parallel walls in TV studios? Yes. Uh, parallel walls work really well 
Um, you just have to come up with treatment. Um, so that's a, that's a, we need the acoustics from an empty room to a populated audience. Hey, David Bialik's here. Hey, David's a monstrously knowledgeable guy about radio and production. Um, yes and no. There's, there's a, um, there are a set of studies of audience absorption and rooms with and without audiences. Uh, most live engineers can tell you that people are really absorptive in the mid frequency range, typically 300, 600. Uh, the room's a little liver without audience. It depends on the spacing of the audience. Um, um, windows, uh, you know, the, whether they're tinted or coated, generally I don't like tinted. Um, there are some coatings that are fine. We use whatever seems right at the time. Um, the insulation ceiling is below or above the mechanical ceiling. Um, the, uh, the insulation ceiling. I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Okay. So this section, what I thought I would do is talk about um, that the fact that every, when I started, you know, we thought about the audience, we thought about the performers in-house. Now we spend a lot of time thinking about how the space is going to be used for broadcast. And this is something that I used to talk to Russell Johnson about saying, let's start building real control rooms in concert hall facilities. And we couldn't talk a lot of people into it. The production space at Carnegie Hall was literally someone's office. Um, now you need to prioritize recording broadcast and we're designing for the audience, the performer and the production space. Um, this has changed the way that stage acoustics are designed and control room space is allocated. Um, Charlie Ryan, one of the co-founders of Brooklyn Ball and someone I have an immense amount of respect for, um, says that, you know, they're trying to understand uh, that the technology changing is going to uh, change the experience of their audiences and the design of their venues, as well as their artists. And uh, they're working to figure it out. Um, I think that's really where everyone is today. Um, Bobby Weir of the Grateful Dead, I asked him for a quote about this and uh, he said, you know, he has to consider the space that he's in as part of his instrument and play accordingly. He's like, you know, people listening on the couch need to see things in a different way and hear things in a different way. And the key issues to address are desired broadcast formats, technical infrastructure and architectural acoustical design elements. Stages are different, are being designed differently. Here's a wonderful project. I don't know if anyone from SF Jazz is on the call, but uh, another wonderful, wonderful organization. Um, if you're from, the, if you're in the San Francisco area, um, please feel free to, um, uh, feel free to uh, stop by there. Um, I forgot to mention one thing. Um, that a lot of what happens in these rooms is uh, you can design it well, but you need a great construction team. And I've been really, really lucky to have some wonderful people um, on the construction teams. Uh, the project manager, the, the company that installed the sound system, the JBL Vertex system into the uh, Pearl, for example, was run by uh, Albert Lachese, who's now passed away, and the project manager was Mark Nutter, who's now with Diversified. And, you know, Mark was involved in uh, reviewing the design with me, um, installation details, uh, wiring details, um, system setup and tuning. And so having a integrator that is working with the consultant instead of against them uh, really makes projects go better. Uh, I was lucky uh, the folks at BBI did the installation here in San Francisco, and um, it's really uh, great when you have a, uh, uh, a team approach. Um, in San Francisco, Randall Klein, who is a uh, really a visionary, uh, is the founder of the SF Jazz Organization, and he sort of willed this building into being, 
and you can see the canopy that uh, we recommended. And that canopy is uh, really acoustical. Um, Randall had some nice things to say about um, that he recognized that building a room with 850 seats was probably going to require him to have an audience that's bigger um, and they do. Um, how you uh, deal with mix is, is an interesting question. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, right, so um, the need to address stage acoustics, the traditional three points, the need for cross-stage communication, the amount of sound from the audience, uh, from the, the stage reaching uh, most of the audience, the amount of sound reflecting back from the stage. And now the new requirement is the need for a microphone friendly environment. I believe that means more diffusion and reduced low frequency energy on stage. Um, here's a quote from Nick talking about how important acoustics was when we built E-Town. This is the Hollywood ball I was able to work on and my son pulling on Vincent Gardner's trombone. Um, so how are you going to uh, record and broadcast your facility? Do you need a dedicated control room? Are we gonna use our house mix as our broadcast mix? Can we limit off access energy from the house PA spilling onto the stage? Who eliminate strong reflections on stage? And that's why I believe, um, uh, that's why I believe diffusion is so important. Microphones and humans are just the same, but microphones are more sensitive to acoustic reflections. That's an ancient audio proverb. Um, here's a picture of one of my mentors, Don Pearson. He took a two mix from a live console, delayed it to a live stereo pair located either at the mix position or a balcony front. And his, he came up with what we call the ultra box. And uh, when I get stuck, I always ask, what would Don do? Um, the quote below is really is not really an ancient proverb. Um, microphones and humans are just the same. Um, it's just a, a truth. Um, this is a real quote, and you can read what Winton had to say. But basically, he's like, capturing sound for remote audience is up to the producers and engin engineers but it's our responsibility to get them the best tools, both electronic and architectural to do that now more than ever. This is the house that Winton built. It's the House of Swing in New York City, jazz at Lincoln Center. Uh, it's a lovely place to hear a concert when it reopens. Uh, I really like this room a lot. Spent a lot of time working on it and um, had a lot of fun. Um, three quick examples of acoustical design issues. Here's what jazz as Lincoln uh, at SF Jazz looks like um, uh, live uh, under construction. This is the stage area. This area behind the upstage wall has variable acoustics curtains. Behind the cur curtains, when the curtains are retracted, it has an exposed um, set of diffusers. And the cloud is also very diffusive. This is looking at the top of the cloud. You're looking down on it from the catwalk. And these are, you can see the diffusers. I turned them 90 degrees to give us a two-dimensional diffuser. Um, I felt that two-dimensional diffusers uh, at this scale aren't efficient enough. So I used one-dimensional diffusers and turned them 90 degrees. I did leave a few holes for sound to get through. And um, it turns out the angle of incidence is very important. Um, we also used a cardioid array. This shows you the five element cardioid array. Um, three elements are firing forward and two elements are firing backward. And if you just put that array with no DSP, um, with no delays on it, it's basically an omnidirectional or egg shaped uh, dispersion pattern. This is at 63 Hertz. And when I add, I reverse the polarity of two and four. So they're firing backwards and they have inverted polarity. And we put a tilt delay on. Um, you can see that we get on the stage, a huge reduction in low frequency energy, which allows the musicians to hear each other better. And we get really uniform coverage for our audience. 
Uh, I am a big fan of this technique. I generally don't like subs in the air, but in a small room where the sound from the stage is important and you have a balcony that you want to reach people, um, this is a really great way to go. Um, the second example is a studio complex. Uh, this was part of the air show mastering world now called Tonal Park. Um, I'm gonna keep going quickly here. Mastering A, control room, tracking room, mastering B, a little production suite, lounge and office and uh, equipment room. Um, this demising wall was not one that we could move. I didn't wanna move the bathroom. Um, came up with this design. You can see the double walls, the asymmetric corners of these rooms. Um, really wonderful facility. After it opened, there's uh, our friend Jay Paul sitting at the mastering location, uh, the elliptical design. This is a base trap. And the reason that's there is that there's a beam that runs asymmetrically across uh, that. So we had to bring the ceiling down. I used the space uh, next to the beam and isolated it and had it open. This is an acoustically transparent cover. There's a duct in there as well. Uh, Dunleavy or Duntech speakers, uh, lovely sounding room. Another picture of it. Um, this is Mastering B, a uh, little bit less uh, size and a little bit less different, more economical treatment. Uh, this is the back of the control room with a diffuser that used to live in my office. Um, this is a front view of the control room. And then we added a 54 person uh, performance space. This is the most expensive slider I've ever installed anywhere. It's an ST63, STC63 slider, um, very expensive. We expanded the isolation booth. We isolated the column. Uh, lots of types of diffusers, uh, flutter X on the wall. These are called good panels. I really, really like these a lot. Um, these are another high frequency diffuser. Um, uh, these are a two dimensional diffuser. The sliding glass door is behind there. You can run sessions in the two rooms simultaneously loud without uh, intrusive noise. One of the hardest problems of this was there's a restaurant and a hardware store upstairs. So we used these little isolators uh, to hang joists so that we didn't end up uh, we're able to save ceiling space except for this small area. And the, the ceiling that we're building never touches the ceiling above. Um, took us a long time to get this permitted and uh, figured out, very difficult challenge. Um, isolation is often a, a big problem and a big expense in these projects. Uh, here you can see the isolator holding up a joist that never touches the ceiling above. Uh, there's Charlie uh, before we put up the fabric finishes and we put the diffusers on and you can see there's a bunch of high density absorption fiberglass there. Um, more diffusion. Uh, oh, the base traps. These are acoustical uh, uh, soffits. Uh, I'm a big believer and fan of these. They're a very cost effective way to get low frequency absorption into a room. Uh, Charlie and I being incredibly silly. Uh, there's a tech nominee thing. And then the last one I'll do quickly was a little jazz club in St. Louis run by some really amazing people. And uh, we built them this room in a building and an adjacent building, a completely tied in recording complex. Um, you'll notice the from San Francisco jazz, the same slotted wood, um, a diffusive and absorptive combination uh, upstage wall, uh, two 12 inch and a horn drivers on uh, boxes on each corner of the stage. There's side fills and there's balcony fills. And this canopy, which has a lot of diffusion here, you can see the balcony fill speakers go around the room. There are subs built into the stage. There's a side fill over here for 
the bar under this overhang. And again, shallow overhangs, slotted wood, uh, trying to keep the room live and have as much sound from the stage be projected without and maintain evenness. This was opening night with the Jazz and Lincoln Center Orchestra. If you get a chance to hear them, it's always good. <laughs> They're just great. Um, this shows you a bunch of different acoustical treatments inside this. Uh, I don't remember how I came up with the patterns. Um, uh, the sprinkler head was just required by law, um, but that's how the panels went in, the diffusive panels. Here's a view from the balcony. Um, you're served by a speaker up here, and I, you can't see the speaker on this side, but you can see the speakers up there. Hey, Sam, I, I have to say it's very refreshing to yeah. see a design with point and shoot boxes as opposed to light arrays, which have oh, propagated can, throughout the yeah. industry. <laughs> if, if you look, if you look at this room, this the, the way the way this came out was the balcony didn't exist. Um, and the band used to play back here under this long overhang and um, it was, they were shooting the long way. And this is uh, much, much wider than it is deep. So the, the best way to cover it was not with a line array. It's, it's just, you know, you don't want to be throwing that hard at a balcony front and wall. There's a bunch of treatment under this fabric. They wanted a clean look and we worked with the, um, we worked with the uh, interior design architect to come up with a look. I have to say, I was against the white chairs uh, I don't think white chairs are a good idea in any club, uh, just from a maintenance point of view. But um, we got all of the wood treatment and acoustical treatment we wanted. And there's a really nice room that the guy who runs this organization is a guy named Gene Dobbs Stanford. And one of the things about all of these rooms is that the people who run them really want them to sound great. They don't want to compromise. So Wynton Marsalis at Jazz Lincoln Center, Nick Forrester at E-Town. Um, Randall Klein, uh, Dave Glasser at Airshow, Charlie Pilcher at Tonal Park. These are people who are really willing. To, they'd rather hit a home run than a single. Like, you know, they, they're willing to take the risks. And, and it's not that you can throw money at it. It's throwing understanding and uh, not making mistakes. Uh, so it's really lovely when your clients are uh, really care about sound. That's a really nice way to approach things. Um, I love this. I wish I could give you some explanation for what I was doing, but uh, I, I don't really have one. Um, I, I sort of like sitting up here and looking down. It's kind of fun. Um, this is a picture of uh, my son, Caden and I at the uh, studio at the Palms run by Zoe Thrall and Brent Spears. and. Uh, Really nice, wonderful people. Uh, so let's open this up to some questions. Is this interesting? Are we, everyone, people here, hello? Um, what do we have? Sam, jumping in here, awesome sure. session. Um, everyone attending, uh, my name is Michael uh, Grandinetti. I'm a content marketing here, content marketing coordinator here at Harmon, and I'll be facilitating the, the Q&A section here with, with Sam. Um, Here's one that came in. You know, is there is there some work in in the influence or directional subarrays in enclosed spaces related to wave acoustics versus image mirroring? Also, audience effect on low frequency in enclosed spaces too. Right. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, define low frequency. Audience effect on low frequency. I don't find that there's a ton. Um, once you get below about 150 hertz, people are you know, more likely to change 150 to 600 uh, in most rooms. I guess it depends on the, the size of the room to some degree and the density of the seating. But um, in general, uh, that falls into a system tuning question to me. Uh, I have a very, very hard rule that I try to impose on all rooms, and that is tonal balance. Uh, Leo Baranek, uh, Great acoustician started uh, Bolt Baranek and Newman, uh, very, um, very, very, very great uh, noise control engineer uh, in his time. And um, uh, Leo 
had a theory that if you took the low frequencies, uh, like the decay at 100 hertz, um, you could compare it to the decay at 1,000 hertz. And I think his ratio was like 25% or something like the low frequencies are going to decay more slowly by 25. He had a rule. And what I did was I modified that rule and I took the average of the decay at 501K and 2K and I compare that to 100 Hertz in octave bands. And my rule is that I want to be under uh, 140%, 135%. So for me, uh, looking at the decays in these rooms, uh, I want tonal balance. I don't care so much about the exact number uh, as much as I do about the relative number. Your ear will resolve a little extra um, uh, um, the little extra or a little less reverberation, but it won't recover from tonal imbalance. Boom hey, Sam, boom. Uh, yeah. when you're talking about total balance in this space and the idea of adding bass traps and extreme low frequency absorption, those so often get the red line because of cost. Is there, are there better ways to treat sub and low frequency bandpass energy that are more cost effective that can offer people a little bit more success at getting those approved? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, you fall in, projects fall into uh, classes, right? So, Subwoofers aren't expensive, and a DSP to make a cardioid is not expensive. Um, we did a project in uh, Nederland, which is outside of Boulder, up in the mountains in Colorado, called the Caribou Room. And it's another room where the audience is there, and then there's a big, giant audio-video control room uh, that we designed for it. And there are five subs, and we made it a cardioid sub to enhance the the... the uh, recording capability and the sound in the room. Um, low frequency absorption has dropped in price. We use these soffits um, that you saw in the pictures of uh, the Tonal Park studio and in Dave Glasser studio um, as, as an inexpensive way to get the um, absorption around. And architects love it because they get the high ducts in it. So they don't have to worry about seeing duct work. Um, this actually falls into a question that, that uh, our Brett uh, answered is that when you're acoustically simulating these designs, how much do you find your predictions differing from real world results? Um, I am very optimistic about predictions. I had this conversation this morning. Um, uh, Nathan Lively does a podcast that's very good, uh, really interesting. And he looked at my uh, San Francisco jazz, SF jazz, cardioid array and tried to duplicate it and had an issue and asked me like, hey, wait a minute. And I had to dig out the settings. And when we measured that, it was incredibly, map was the map program we used was very, very close. I mean, uh, the decay rates in uh, most of our rooms are really close. The reflections are really close. Um, so I think things are getting better and better. Uh, our tonal balance is really good uh, in terms of predictions. Excellent. We have uh, quite a few questions here. We're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we'll definitely tackle a few more. Um, okay. Here's a hypothetical for one for you, Sam. Uh, you've tuned the room, and then the mix engineer doesn't like the way the venue or the system sounds. How do you handle the situation? Oh, uh, we kill him. <laughs> <laughs> Just chop his head off. You know, no. Um, uh, first of all, you hope that doesn't happen. What, what you hope is that it's not that they don't like the sound. It's not the sound they want, right? So what we do in all of these systems is we lock in our limiters and our uh, system EQ settings in processors that I don't let house engineers touch, right? Like you can't touch that. Um, what, I, what we do is we give them an EQ on different sections of the cluster if they want. They want to uh, put an EQ and throw a little high frequency stronger on, up to the balcony. The biggest issue is how people run subs and that's music dependent, right? Um, this reggae guy came in one time and said, hey, man, this is the tightest, best sounding sub system 
alignment I've ever heard. I love it. Can I change it now? And I was like, what do you say? It'll never fly for my guys. And he, he, I was like, what do you want to do? He's like, you know, you've got your crossover at like 73 hertz, move it to 100. And I'm like, what? And he's like, I want mud, man. I want a lot of mud. <laughs> okay, whatever you want. Um, people in, in uh, classical music and light rock tend to run subwoofers six to eight dB above the uh, low frequency uh, device level. Harder rock, eight to 10, 12 dB, you know, house, hip hop, things that are more bass centric, 12 to 16 dB. And then, you know, your uh, EDM and- EDM. Hard, yeah, EDM and hardcore reggae are running 18 to 24 dB above. And as you know, when you raise the level of the subwoofer, you're moving the acoustic crossover point up and now your subs and your main array are putting out the same energy from different locations. So you're gonna have some areas of buildup and some areas of cancellation. But um, what we did do to resolve that is we have different settings for subwoofers and the presets uh, for the system. So when there's a reggae band or an EDM band uh, at Brooklyn Bowl, for example, they just hit a preset. It's called reggae slash EDM. Excellent. We'll try to tackle a few more here before we run out of time. Um, here's an interesting one. What would you recommend for someone who's experienced in TEF to reasonably painlessly? Yeah, it, it, you know, I, I see this one. That's, that's going um, in your way back machine. Yeah, no. Um, here's the thing. TEF, time delay spectrometry, which is the what TEF was a measurement system. That's the, the, the technique is great for an assembly line or a part. The goal of this of TEF system is to isolate the thing you're testing from the room you're in, right? And uh, um, uh, the goal of SMART is to use a variable time window to at high frequencies, isolate the loudspeaker. And as you move down in frequency, include more and more of the room. The time windows, when you look at a frequency chart in SMART, what you're looking at is a Frankenstein measurement, right? At the high frequencies, you're looking at a time window of about one millisecond. And at low frequencies, you're looking at a time window of about three quarters of a second. That's how we achieve equal resolution in every octave, right? The reason this works so well and the reason it drove so many TEF people crazy was that it's fundamentally different approach. And the reason is, is that they were trying to eliminate the room. I don't, you hear the room, you want to EQ a sound system and set up a sound system to minimize the negative interactions of the system with itself and the room it's in. That's, that's the point. So if you, if you just, take a moment and think about the transfer function in SMART as a multi-windowed, multi-time windowed um, function where you you're want to include the room. A really cool thing to do is to put the uh, microphone on the floor of the room you're in, in the corner. Right? So take any hard room or any, any room really, uh, office, and put a microphone on the floor in the corner, you'll see the modes in a smart measurement. You won't see the modes in a TEF measurement, right? Because TEF measurement's trying to window them out and smart's keeping that window open for the better part of a second. So I think it's just about thinking about it as something different. Um, why am I against flying subs? I'm not, I wanna answer this one. Uh, I'm not against flying subs. I'm against flying small arrays of subs when you don't get the array effect. Does we've that got, make sense? We've got one here. It says, how much headroom do you maintain in venues like the Brooklyn Bowl, considering the various genres of performances? You know, that's a good question. Um, those arrays are really big. Uh, that system can get really loud. Um, so... Uh, there's a lot of headroom there. I, I, I don't know. I, I've never actually looked. I mean, we've had that system 
Uh, I went to a show there, uh, an EDM show with a band, uh, and they were, um, you know, they, they were running it like 116, and there was still room to go. Um, uh, how's that? Um, I, there's another question I'd like to answer if I could. Mm -hmm. um, my friend Anthony asks, uh, what products are you considering for your gypsum partitions that back up? Um, that's, a, that's a great uh, question. We, we tend to be big fans of using damping compound between layers of gyp. Uh, there's a product called Sound Damp 2 that I like from Kinetics. Um, that if we put up, let's say we're doing two layers of gyp, we'll put a layer up, we'll do a damping, viscous damping material to sort of make the wall heavy and increase our surface mass density, and then put up another layer of gyp. If it's three layers, we do it between the second layer and the innermost layer. We don't do it between both, just one. Uh, that's enough. And then for studs, um, we tend to use, uh, for a lot of these venues, six inch studs because they're very tall. And the insulation that we use, um, we like the mineral wool insulation, the, fire, the sound attenuation, fire bats, rock saw, rock wool stuff is great. Um, there's a new stud called uh, Soundguard, which has a split stud. So in, it, you get the performance of two studs in the thickness of three and five eighths. It's got a little uh, rubber gasket between the two pieces of stud. Um, and that's a, a really interesting product that I like and I'm trying to get into its new one. Um, Tyler Cottrell. Hey, Tyler, how you doing, man? Tyler asks, when tuning a sound system, what are some of your favorite listening tracks? Sadly, um, sadly, uh, I am uh, uh, sad to say that my favorite tracks for tuning are tracks that I hate listening to now because I've heard them 10,000 times. Um, I start with acoustic music and I work my way up through the loudest stuff I can. Um, I don't know if there's a, uh, if I can, Michael, I don't know if I can do this, but I can give a list of tracks I'm using uh, for the acoustic music. Uh, the Diane Reeves recording from the movie um, about, uh, the movie that George Clooney made about uh, Edward Murrow. Um, there's a track that has a bass vocal and uh, piano is just, the bass is stunning, her vocal is sibilant and clear. Um, uh, there's a Foo Fighters song, Bridges Burning, that just keeps getting louder no matter uh, how loud you play it. Uh, and it's just super, super tight. And the vocals are clear. I tend to pick songs that don't have layers of reverb. Um, I want to find, um, I want to find why, um, uh, I try to find tracks where you can hear the distinct uh, instruments. Uh, I love some recordings by the band Galactic. I use a song called Black Eyed P. Um, a very famous engineer called me up and I published that in an article and he called me up at 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning and started screaming at me, Black Eyed Peas for critical listening, are you crazy, blah, 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 blah. And I went, no, no, not the Black Eyed Peas, a song called Black Eyed P by the band Galactic. He's, oh, never mind, and hung up. I, I love that. Um, do we have time for one or two more here? Yeah, I was going to say maybe about two more. Um, so I don't know if you want to pick the ones or I can read off a couple, um, uh, whatever you think. Go for it. Um, I, would, I saw this one. How do you achieve a stereo image using point source speakers installed so wide apart in the second to last slide that you've shown? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, that's in, uh, uh, let me see if I can pull it up. There. Um, how do I, do you know what, what people are listening to there? They're listening to the sound from the stage. Um, so you actually hear the sound from the stage uh, and that gives you the sense of localization. I don't call it a stereo image as much as I do a localized sound. Uh, one of my favorite tricks for setting up delay speakers is shutting your eyes and pointing to where the sound is coming from. And if you're pointing at the delay speaker, the delay speaker is too damn loud or has the wrong EQ on it. Um, I like to localize to the stage. And if you shut your eyes, if you're sitting, if you're standing right where I am and you say, okay, where's the piano? You'll, you'll shut your eyes and point to the piano. You'll shut your eyes and point to the drums. And we've even gone so far as to blindfold people so they don't know 
where the instruments are visually. And last one, we and I apologize, we have a lot more questions coming in that we're not going to be able to get to all of them. But uh, this was looking someone looking for recommendations here. We have a 378 seat theater built in 1970, trying to soften walls with sound baffles. Any other suggestions? Yeah, diffusive surfaces. You know, um, one of the beautiful things about scattering, I mean, there are only three things you can do, right? You can change the angle of the wall. That's construction, big time construction. You can add baffles. Um, there are a lot of baffles and then there's diffusion. And now there's a new category of products, which has been around for a while, but it's diffusion with absorption. So you get mid low frequency absorption and you get high mid frequency diffusion. And there are a bunch of those products around. We create our own sort of version by using the flutter strips. Um, there's flutter X, there's flutter free. There's all these strips that are diffusive. Um, and what happens is you put absorption behind them. I don't know if you remember the slide with the corner trap, but that was a studio up in uh, 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 Northern California. And we put a mid high, a two inch thick uh, diffuser that's really a mid high frequency diffuser. Uh, it only goes down to, I, I think, 800 hertz, 700 hertz. But uh, it's a very good diffuser. It's a two dimensional diffuser. It looks cool. And then we stuffed a bunch. I mean, you know, it's a pretty big angle. It's a four foot cut across the room and it's open. And we lined it with six pound and four pound uh, density fiberglass. So we have a low frequency absorber and a high mid frequency scattering in the same place. And uh, we did that on the walls at E-Town as well. And I think that's a really nice thing to do because, you know, if you need to soften up the room, you don't want it to lose a sense of presence. You know, that's sort of that. Excellent. Well, Sam, you know, on behalf of Harmon, want to thank you for your time and for this awesome session. To all of our attendees, we appreciate all the engagement, all the questions and the attendance. The recorded version of the session will be available here in just a couple of days. So definitely be on the lookout for that on our Harmon training portal and also on our YouTube sites, our YouTube channels. Um, for everybody, thanks again for your participation and uh, be on the lookout for our upcoming sessions on audio, video, lighting, control, also available on our Harmon Learning Sessions portal. And for that, just want to say thanks again and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Sam. Hey, bye-bye, Jay.